RC, I go by the name Carmody. And I was quite poor enough to use my full name, so it's my last name. Uh, and my favorite ice cream would be Cranley, uh, Cranley and Cream. Is that what it's called? <laughs> <laughs> Cranley's and Cream. Real dedicated to that ice cream. <laughs> So, today um, we're going to talk about Wettis. Uh, this is a talk that, who was here two years ago when I gave this here at the UPTU? Yeah, I was. One? Perfect, it's gone. Okay, good. Uh, kind of want to turn up the internet. I'll be giving this talk at Chinor PhD next month in Toronto, Canada. Um, so, thank you for, for being my guinea pigs as we uh, check it out. All right. Yeah, so, very relevant President. Um, I primarily think of myself as I make and break web stuff, and I like to focus on kind of more scalable and online websites that have been in a lot of stuff in the over the last few years. Okay, presentation. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll ask questions. Uh, you can go ahead and ask them in the presentation. We'll have a set time, so feel free to interrupt me as much as you want. Um, also, at the end, um, I will post links to the, all the um, to the, I'll upload the presentation online, probably slide share, as well as uh, post links to the GitHub repository with demo code, all that stuff. And then our goal in this presentation is to, to educate and inspire you. I say, hey, this is what Redis is good at. Maybe go home and play with it a little bit. And then one day when you have, hey, I have a need that Redis would be a great fit, you're aware of it, and you know, hey, I'm going to try this out. Because um, a lot of people aren't familiar with Redis, what it does. So, quickly, we'll, we'll gauge and measure the audience real quick. How many here has, have, have uh, heard of Redis before? Okay. Who here has used it before? And they're using it currently in production. Okay. Very good. good. Very good mix. Um, so, I want to talk about a common problem that we all face in this day and age. Um, so, let's say you're an awesome digital developer. And your boss calls you and says, hey, I want to track how many users we have online on our website at any given moment. And so you yeah, want to know how many people are looking at the website. And so your developer says, hey, I'll just add a table to my SQL and just do an insert or an update or something every time someone visits, visits the uh, website. So you tell your boss, hey, it's been implemented, go relax, don't worry about it. Then all the data starts compiling in. Things explode, servers melt, there's a massive cleanup effort to get everything back online, your boss has been burned by you taking down the site, he gets a little angry with you perhaps, your coworkers make fun of you for your team for taking on the site, and ultimately it leads you to being a sad developer. Um, and the cool thing is, you know, over the last few years there have been more and more data stores that have come out, and people are more accustomed to having even Mongo or, or MySQL, maybe a different version of MySQL, like a Percona or a MariaDB, um, all these different things. Um, it was very common several years ago, you just had MySQL, and the idea was like, well, if you have data, I'll just stick it in there. Um, uh, but the problem is, you know, we're no longer just serving web pages. We're no longer just, um, you know, uh, having, you know, even a simple example, a blog, typically nowadays it's not even like just a blog. You have like live blogs, at least if they're live blog, you know, this new stuff that Apple's coming with. And, you know, hundreds of thousands of people will slam these live blogs trying to see the first picture of the iPhone 5C, pink, whatever it may be. Um, and there's similar to characteristics of those real time data that makes old traditional data stores at MySQL or databases struggle. Um, typically, we'll have some, either some one of the following two: either a very high volume of writes or a high volume of reads. Um, and typically, it's a combination of both. You know, if you have a chat room, you have lots of people who are typing in, writing data, you know, posts. Then in the chat room, you have lots of people who are listening, pulling data. Um, Another really simple thing: if you want a lower latency or delay, you know. So in a chat room, once again, 
if you had people type a message to enter and it took a minute for that message to go to everyone, no one would use a tablet because it uh, takes forever. And so it's kind of, kind of not only is it fast to write and read from, but whenever that read event, that write event happens, you want everyone else to be able to read that data immediately. Um, and sometimes that data can grow very uh, exponentially or very fast compared to the rest of your data. And so we'll talk, here's a couple examples of some tricky real-time data to handle. Um, one thing is real-time collaboration. Uh, you know, if you ever use like Google Docs, you know, people are editing the same document at the same time, you know, or if you're, you know, or like a Google Hangout or something where you're both, you know, everyone's doing the same thing. Um, that typically is, requires very intensive of data, of users sharing what they're doing and then broadcasting that out to everyone else to read to their version of reading and accept. Um, API limiting, uh, you know, lots of people um, use APIs. This is kind of dark. Oh, hopefully you guys can see uh, all these, these pictures. Um, but API limiting, you know, so you have, you go on to an awesome API, and you see that you have, you know, dozens of users who are just pounding heavily, and you say, hey, I want to go to my limits. But sometimes even trying to handle limits, even your API can handle you know, checking those limits and whatnot. Um, so this can be a tricky problem to try to solve. Um, Real-time logging. Uh, I know at work we're trying to look at some solutions for this where you might have 30 different servers and an event or something happens. So I want to be able to go and look real time at the logs pulling up, uh, pouring in and say, hey. You know, we just pushed to production and something went wrong. I wanted to go look and see the logs that are happening across all my different web servers I have in production. Um, There's just some, some ideas of things that can be kind of tr uh, tricky. And traditional data stores, like uh, MySQL, Postgres, um, you know, for, typically for database, writing is, is, is kind of resource intensive. Um, when you insert data into a database, you just go ahead and insert that, make, sh make sure it makes it in there, update the indexes, um, and also, typically, there's, your data is stored on a disk. And so when you perform writes, um, whenever, you, whenever you work with the disk, it's, it's, it's much slower than when you're, when, you're, when you're working with something in memory. Um, and typically, as the data set grows, um, your, uh, your database can get slower. And then if you want to replicate that data, that enters a whole new challenge of, you know, how do I have my databases replicate data without, you know, falling out of sync or, or um, whatever. And so typically when you either have high reads, or especially high writes in the database, it'll melt down a lot faster than something like Redis. And so there are many, many, many MySQL, uh, NoSQL solutions out there. You have the Mongols from Couch in the world, you have the Tokyo cabinets, you have the um, Cassandras, and uh, you know, there's lots of them that are out there. They're all trying to say, hey, I want to try and provide something that traditional databases would provide. Um, and Redis's niche is that it's built for speed, plain and simple. If, if Redis had a niche in the market for NoSQL, it's all about speed and efficiency. Um, and so it's a key value store where um, you don't have relational data in there or whatever. It's basically you have a unique identifier, which is your key, and it stores some data. And it stores everything in memory. And so some people think, well, wait, hold on a second. Isn't that just memcached? Because that's what memcache does. It, you know, it's a key value, has some keys, and it stores all its values in the database. <coughs> it says, well, it's not. Um, Redis takes it one step further, we'll keep it the same performance, and says, hey, I want to add persistence. I want to add multiple data types. So I want to be able to store not just a string, but maybe a list of that are stored in, or, 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 a, or a hash, or other different things. Um, it also supports transactions. They say, hey, I want to make sure that these operations happen in sequential order, nothing else interrupts it. You can do that. Um, if you want to do some sort of uh, publish, subscribe methodology, like for the chat room example, where you say, hey, all the, all the clients can, 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 can subscribe to the channel, and then you can publish a message to that channel, and all the clients can receive it immediately. Um, and it is fast. Why is it fast? I mean, it is extremely fast. 
Well, I mean, extremely fast. Fast A is ludicrous speed fast. I don't know if anyone gets the reference. Space, space balls. One of my favorite all time movies of all time. And we're talking about hundreds of thousands of reads and writes per second. Which, you know, for a typical like my simple solution to do that requires lots and lots of infrastructure and planning. And, um, and a lot of times it was much better if the data fits and works with the model that Redis has, it's much better to use Redis. And so I'd say Redis is my plaid. That's a baseball reference. <laughs> um, and so we'll quickly run over how to address and then we'll dive into some uh, tutorials. Um, so step one is to, to install on one. If you're on Mac or Linux, uh, or Linux, anything that's kind of close in space, uh, you can compile it from the source. If you have any dependencies, you can download the source code, type make, make install, boom, you're done. It, it's, it's very, very simple. Um, nowadays, there's, there are like, for Ubuntu and Debian, there are PPAs um, that are out there that have, you can use to install via apt, or there's uh, part of I forget, the, I forget the Red Hat ones. RPM. RPMs and things of that nature that you can use um, nowadays. And Redis is changing as quickly as it used to. You know, back you know, three years ago, you have significant changes within a three month period. So it was kind of good to install from source. Nowadays, you know, a major release would be happens once a year. Um, and so, or every, every other year. And so, uh, it's, it's, there's lots of good stable um, ways of installing it that you know from the latest version. If you're on Windows, there are some third-party uh, binaries out there that kind of work. Um, I haven't seen any of them updated. Um, or you can go ahead and try to compile it. I wish you best of luck. My thing is, if you're going to use it on Windows, install a VM, put Linux on it, and run it that way. My, and Microsoft actually has a patch to Redis. That Traction libraries. Oh, really? Yeah. It's not going to go in mainline Redis, but it's out there if you want it. And another option to play. Oh, really? Oh, well, that's good. I did. This is why I give it these talks before. Because then I ask the really smart people, you guys, <laughs> to make sure I'm not saying anything dumb before I can tell the poor people. Um, running Redis, it's as simple as going to command, type in console, type Redis server, enter, and it'll run. Um, you can have a configuration file, and if you're going to run it as far as a service that's always running, which typically if you're using production, that's what you're going to do. Um, you have a quick start for how to do that, or if you install it via an RPM or a PPA or, you know, .dev, um, it'll, it'll set up a service for you. And so once it's running, you can type webs-cli and you can try out the commands. Um, so, I mean, we'll <coughs> These are some uh, jump <coughs> temporary servers I spun up on Amazon using Vagrant. Um, you know, so I just type, so I just log into my server. This is about, and then just type Red CLI, hit enter, and it connect to the default port to the local host. If I wanted to pass it, the host I can do that. Connect that way, and I can just run commands and. Simple to type the next command. Just go ahead. Um, like it, is, it is super, super simple. Um, one of the nice things about Redis is that to keep it so fast that you need to keep it simple, which makes it easy to use. So, all right. So we'll jump back over here. Keep up going. Okay. So after you have Redis installed and running, the next step is to kind of be thinking of key value storage thinking about keys. Um, so for Redis keys, your keys must be unique. Um, if they're not, you have data overwritten. It's like, it's like having one giant table of MySQL kind of, one primary key. That's what, that's what we all share. And so your keys must be unique. Uh, a couple of the technical details must be binary safe strings. 
Um, super long keys are kind of costly. I don't recommend having an enormous, you know, you know, 1,000 or 24 byte long key. Um, but using a cryptic key, such as U colon 1,000 colon PWD versus user colon 1,000 colon password, there's not really a performance gain. So it's, it's, you don't have to be cryptic. I mean, it's extremely short. Uh, go ahead and use descriptive keys. You don't have, but if you want to store, use like I'm trying to think of a bad example. Is like the value, like the, the value of a, like if you used a actual image source as a key, that'd be frowned upon. Um, and so the next step is thinking key value because it's all about the keys, not about the values. There is no query traditionally in, in Redis. There are no indexes, there are no schemas. You basically say, hey, if I want to have a key of this, I can put in that value, and as far as Redis is concerned, it doesn't even care about what's in there. It just it knows, hey, I have this value in here, and that's about it. Um, and so what it requires is you need to think about your data you're putting in there, and then you need a document somewhere. So typically, I'll have a model that interacts with the Redis, and that model I'll just have the very top of it piece we document or something, document out, hey, here's kind of the naming patterns we use for our Redis server um, for this, for the data that's going in and out. That way I can have someone go look it up real quick. Um, so after that, next step, um, final step is to kind of to know your data types. Like I said, mentioned before, for memcache, you want you have one data type in a string. And if you wanted to, you could maybe put like JSON code and array, and save that JSON in cache. Um, but then you really can't manipulate that data inside of that value. Um, and so memcache, or Redis, gives you a handful more data types to use that give you a little bit more flexibility and power um, that allow you to do lots of cool stuff. So you can store strings just like memcache. Um, these, you need to just make sure the binary is safe. Um, it's great for putting JSON data in there. Um, and there was, there are some advanced commands from the ability to string tool go into, but you could do even things like uh, binary bitwise operations on data in uh, those strings. Then after strings, you basically have four other types, and I call it kind of the data matrix. And instead of just being a simple string, it's like a, a data structure. And so you have, over here, you have um, the sorted and unsorted, Comparable and standalone. And so um, we'll, we'll start with the standalone symbol. So you have lists which are uh, designed for you to be able to put interact with the ends of the list, type the queue. And so you can go and add information to the beginning or the end of the list. You can, you can check how long it is, um, things of that nature. And those are sources. So you put some the first. Put in something one, two, three, four, five, and you pull it out, it'll come back as one, two, three, four, five. It remembers the sort of um, You have hashes, which are basically like, uh, it's kind of like, an, it's like a, a, an array in PHP that's not sorted. So if I put in one, a key and a value, it's kind of like a nested redis almost. If I put in a key value of you know, one, two, three, four, five, and I pull it out, this will come back to me as five, two, four, three, one. Um, it won't we'll, we'll, um, store the sorting of it. And what happens to me is that it's very, 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 very efficient but very, very fast. Um, and then you have what are called sets. You have regular sets, which are unsorted. You have sorted sets, which are able to kind of get an index ranking into the items in there. And the cool thing about sets is that as we need to get very large amounts of data in a hash, in a list, it doesn't impact performance. When you get those in sets, it does impact performance. If you have like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of items in there, the cool thing with sets is you can compare them against one, one another, which I'll show an example of here shortly. Um, and so the quick, my quick variable guide, hashes, typically I use the most, they're small in size, they're very, very efficient. Um, lists are awesome for queues because you, you can operate at the end. And the size will not impact performance whatsoever. You can have a list of 10 items, a list of a 
familiar with loading items and performance will be the same as long as you're getting data from the end of the list. Sets are great for inter inter intersecting data with other sets. Um, they don't, you don't need uh, sorting. And sort sets was, are great for kind of, I used to almost kind of like homegrown indexes, um, which you can pass scores. Um, so, any questions so far? Okay. Oh, final step is one of the commands. Okay, so, um, uh, there, are, there are a handful of generic commands that will all types of keys, all types of data in the keys, and then you have the commands for each data type. Um, and in the documentation, each command has a big own notation for performance. If you're big into that, you can kind of look and see the expense of the operation. Um, and they're really simple, yet very powerful, and they a lot of flexibility. Um, so here's an example of the REST documentation. Uh, you just go there, you go to commands, and you have the second tab, which is different types, things that either apply to all, or things that apply to keys, or trees, or hashes. And so over here, will my mouse work? I don't have my laser here. Um, so, for example, if I have a cache called uh, uh, UPHPU, or the key, or, yeah, <coughs> and then I go into each set, I want to set a value to that cache, so key, key, UPHPU, and I'll just show it. Um, okay. Okay, H set, my key, UPHPU. Oh, awesome. All right, and then we'll put in uh, this IRC name and real name, and then each set. It's not guaranteed. Um, Question real quick. Yeah. I'm, this is all brand new to me. I'm all my SQL basically. Oh, yeah, that's fine. So it, the, the UPHU portion of that, is that similar to what you consider like a table basically? But it's a, uh, it's a hash? Is that yeah, so it, I mean, you could kind of consider. Or it's you know, a hash data type? Is that what it is? Yeah, so, and so what happens is it do this. So here are all of the keys that I have in my um, my uh, list of stuff. Okay. And so these might be different um, data types. My list is probably a list. Uh, some of these are strings, like the stats is a string. Like if I get this, 
was like, oh, that was just storing the JSON um, data. Uh, whereas, like, another thing, like, if I try to do, like, get on my client status, it's going to be, hold on a second. How, anyone remember how to like, see what key type this thing is?
uh, all my user profile information. Uh, I really should have updated these not just serialized as JSON. But um, if, if I do get something, I'm going to unserialize the data and send that to the data value. If not, I'll do my data then try to get a really expensive data like profile, whatever hours these things it takes to run. And then I'm going to save that to Redis to say, hey, use the key. I want to save for 60 seconds. And um, go ahead and serialize that and save it as a string. Uh, so this is you know, very similar to what we would use using uh, um, Memcache. Now, let's say you were doing uh, uh, API limiting for an API call that says you cannot call more than than five times in uh, in a second. Um, you can do something where every time a call gets made, you can increment the value um, for a key for that like API key, and then pass back the new value you committed to. And if that ever gets up to five, you can say hey. Throw an error, tell them that they're not allowed anymore, and, and set the expiration for how we want who all period we want to be. Um, uh, if not, you can just tell expire, hey, expire this value in one second. So that way, you know, we, we cannot, that way if they hit you too fast, it'll you can throw start throwing them errors. If not, that key will automatically expire after one second. Um, and that expiration. Um, uh, typically, uh, I think if you perform an update by default, there's some figures that it will remove the, the, the it'll remove the time, so you can re-add it or retell it. Hey, you need to uh, expire. Um, or I think there's a way to set the this. Hey, even if this key is updated, I still want to expire this time. Um, so there's ways of doing both of those. Um, I can I can read docs and let you know exactly what those commands are. Um, so how about we'll use an example of the user dog line. Um, so we're gonna use sets. Um, and so typically the the, the, um, the commands are gonna prefix to a funny <coughs> S for it's gonna be the type of S is working with sets. But so we're gonna use the S. Um, S add is the add and hide and use set. Um, those in the sets, all the values in there are, are unique amongst each other. Um, and so you say, hey, I want to pass the rest key and then add this value. And then we use S unique for you to say, hey, get all of the values that exist in these keys and you can smash them together. If they're duplicates, throw out the duplicates. But, but make sure if it, if it exists in any one of those keys, that it returns me that value. And then we have the expire uh, command. And so when a, when a user hits your website, you know, you could have this, you know, in, in somewhere, you know, in, in that, somewhere in your code that's called every time. Um, and you say, hey, okay, you, you grab the user ID somehow. And say, I want to put the uh, current time is how long this time will be to report. Put the body scan support. It's the current minute. Yeah, it's the current minute for now. Um, and I want to generate a key called online for the minute. So in my Redis, I'm going to have uh, for every, you know, at, one, at, at any point, I can have online one, or online zero, online one, online two, online three, online four. Five, etc. And every time those will contain a user ID of anyone who hit the website at that at that minute. So I add it to that set. I say, hey, expire that key in ten minutes. Um, so that way I'm not building up new ones. Or by the time you know, if it's like thirty minutes now, in one hour when I come back to the thirty mark, that key's been expired already. So I know I'm not going to be re-adding users to the full data. And so I say, hey, I want to get the users who are online right now. I say, okay, give me the time, bring them the time. And then the minute, give me the minute. 
there's some logic. What this basically does is it creates a set of keys that says, here are the last five minutes. So if I'm at minute 10, it'll create this array of keys. And then 10, and then 9, and then 8, and then 7, and then 6. It'll look be a list of all those keys. And then I'm going to with Redis, I'm going to create a command dynamically to turn to pass this in uh, hard coding it. And say, I want to get S union of these five keys. Now we'll turn an array of all the user IDs who have touched the website in the last five minutes. And so what's really cool is that this, this you can add this, and it won't, and as long as your register is up, you know, it will not impact your performance whatsoever. These operations are crazy fast. Um, uh, I forget the guy's name, the founder of Redis. There's two main guys who work on it, and if you follow their tweets, one of them was complaining about how they added a new operation and it took like 170 nanoseconds to complete, and they were concerned about performance implications. So when, when they think 170 nanoseconds is too long, then, then you know uh, it's going to be very, very fast. Um, It'd be awesome, I should have these all in a thing where I can test them and show up live. So I'll add that for next time I give this. And so, let's say not only do you want to know uh, um, how many people are online, you might have a million people online. I don't I'll, I'll care about my friends who are all online. And so we're going to use the same, or pretend we have the same code from before. We're also going to do a uh, SUNU store, which is basically say, I want a union, I want to take all these keys, combine them together, and store them in a new key. Um, and then S enter is the kind of opposite of SUNU. It'll say, hey, tell me the values that exist in all of these keys. So what we're going to do is just say we have our array of online users. Okay, so say my users. Oh, okay. Okay, so there's my user ID. There's the current, the current minute of the hour. I go through and generate here are all the five minute go values. I'm going to come down here and say, I want to store a set of all online users. Oh, because it's okay. So I start this keys off on online users. That's my destination. I build all the ones I want to unionize and put together. I call it S Union Sourcing. I want to store um, in online users any user who's been on the last five minutes. And then I'm going to call it as enter and say, hey, let's say somewhere I saved all my friend IDs to Redis for user, user ID and friends IDs. I want to compare out of all the all the users that are online, which of those also are my friends. Now I'll return you a list of an array of any user IDs who are in my friends and are online. In a very this this will this will happen in a few milliseconds. So does that online user's key persist in Redis past this connection? Uh, this one does. And so, yeah. And so what I would have been smart is I might have, instead of having a, uh, I might have a worker, instead of having a request to build that, I might have a worker that updates that or, or whatever. Um, this is, yeah, this is the way it's um, And one nice thing about Redis is that all is single threaded and uh, all operations are atomic. And so you can't have a conflict of two people trying to save the same value at the same time. Like one will happen before the other. So even though it might not be perfectly ideal to, to regenerate um, this online users Redis list every time, it happens so fast that it probably make a big difference unless you have like tens or hundreds of thousands of users online at one time. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay.
So I'm going to add a few couple things. Um, so yeah, Redis is single threaded. Um, you can shard if, if you can't. If you need more capacity, um, you can shard based off queues uh, to multiple Redis servers. Right now, they're working on something called Redis Cluster. It's been worked on for like three or four years. They still haven't worked on all the kinks. So all the sharding you can do will be on your own. Um, all commands are atomic, so so you know you don't have to worry about two commands on at the same time overriding each other. Uh, you can do transactions, say, hey, I want to make sure that these commands always run one after another. Um, and then you can use pipelining for high performance. What pipelining is that typically when you send a command to Redis, it goes out. It's kind of like transactions on the pipeline that doesn't guarantee that uh, nothing happens in between. Um, the pipeline basically, uh, you can pass multiple execute multiple commands to run at the same time. So you, you send over multiple commands at once, it executes them all, and then returns them back. And so if you're doing lots of stuff with Redis, this just helps cut down on, uh, on uh, the network handshake and kind of stuff that's going on. Um, uh, with persistence, there's two ways to do persistence. Um, uh, snapshot through configuration on uh, a uh, schedule. So what you do is you can say, hey, if there has been at least one change in the last 24 hours, I want to make sure you do a snapshot change. If there's been a thousand changes in the last hour, I also want you to do a snapshot just in case. And then if you've had like 10,000 changes in the last 10 minutes, do another snapshot. So you can kind of configure how the snapshots. Um, and then I'm not super technical, I hope it's not like, uh, terminology, but Redis on Linux and stuff, when, when the snapshot begins, it'll actually fork um, its process. One process will keep track of all the changes, the other one will have memory at that point in time and, and write that to disk. And then once it's finished, it'll, it'll, un, it'll unfork, rejoin, and then apply all the changes. It sounds kind of technical, but what, what, what that means is that Redis memory limits are kind of soft. So if I tell like memcache, you can get two gigs, it's going to use two gigs, won't go over at all. If you use snapshots and say Redis, I want you to use two gigs, it'll, it'll see, take up capacity for two gigs, then with the during the snapshot process, it can use up to more. Because it's, it's held that two gigs in memory, and it won't make any changes to it, and it's accepting changes. But it's still keeping track of new things that has to write that once the snapshot's finished. Um, and so I just, I just ran into a problem when I had when I, when I would have you know, tens of thousands of write operations coming in and it was keeping track of those that I was like, oh, I only have two things on the server, so I want to give it as much as I can. I thought it was a hard one, but it's more of a soft one. So typically I recommend to give, if you want a server just as Redis, just give it three fourths of memory and it'll be fine. Um, you also, um, because if Redis or the server reboots between snapshots, you will lose any data changes. And so if, if the type and characteristics, characteristics of your data are not conducive to losing them. Um, so online users, in our example, if we reboot our server, that's okay because within five minutes, that data will be repopulated. It's kind of throwaway data, we don't care about it. Um, if you were, I would recommend it, but if you were storing um, like invoices, like purchase transactions in Redis, um, I would say you can use the append only file. And what that does is that it will, uh, every time a write operation happens, it will append it to a log and then um, and then write to memory. And so what that will do is that it'll guarantee if you reboot, it'll have to read that log again um, to, to, re to get it all caught up. You won't lose any, you won't lose any data. Um, but your performance will not be nearly as good with the pending file that it will be with persistent with the snapshots. Uh, so it'll, it'll let you survive a reboot. Um, Lewis scripting, you can use that in Redis 2.6. Um, it kind of allows for querying. Um, it's kind of like MapReduce ish. But basically, what it allows you is you can pass a Lewis script to Redis and say, hey, do all these little things real quick. And it'll go through and run this kind of script saying, do a git, do a set, do this, do that, whatever, and then return the result. Um, uh, I've never used it, uh, but some people really like it. Um, so if that's, if that's something that's available out there, if you want to um, try it out. Um, but it works really well if you have 
lots of operations that happen all the time that you just want to say, you just want to be able to say, hey, perform this set of operations instead of saying, hey, here's a list of 10,000 commands I want you to run. Okay, so how about we do a live demo? Okay, so we have kind of one Redis server, it's on AWS, all, so this one Redis server is running on a M1 small, just a standard small server on AWS. I have 15 servers running 100 clients, or 10 clients, so 150 workers. And, oops, and all those workers, we're gonna throw operations at Redis, and we'll see how many we get. Um, this demo, I'll have all the links to GitHub. It's on GitHub, but it's using Vagrant, AWS, SaltStack to coordinate kind of setting up all the servers, and then Redis and PHP. So, demo time. And this demo's not all the way done, so I have, there's some buttons and knobs I haven't added to it. And there's a lot of buttons and knobs I have not added to this yet. But, here's my control panel. All right, and so what I have here is, is, is I have here a list of modes for my workers to be in. I need to add the toggle, but through my Redis server, Um, and I found a button that's the command is using the calculate CPU. It's actually not very, not quite that accurate. Uh, so CPU will be a little higher than when it reports. Um, so if I do my keys command, I say system. Hey, build up. Hello. Hey. All right. So we have. Okay. So I have this. I just have a variable that I can say, hey, I want you to use this percentage of the workforce. So if I pass it to 20, these guys get the message. I can say, oh, 30 workers are going to be active, or I can go on and say I'm 100. And all 100 will turn on. We'll, we'll, go, we'll use 10% right now. And so that's the number of workers I'll be using. Over here is how many, uh, I should name, rename some commands. This is how many commands per second <coughs> the Redis server is uh, using. And so I'm going to switch, these are modes, this is idle mode. So all the workers are idle. So if I go over to my simple get mode, these 15 servers are going to do this. They're basically going to get the Prince client and in the loop for 500 times, get this value, and then be done and then read and then, and then, and then work is called again. And so right now I have 15 servers that are sitting there trying to get data as fast as they can and these are all uh, AWS virtual servers. They're not CPU super strong, they're down to super strong. We're getting about 11,000, 12,000 requests per second. Um, if I go over here, close view. Let's say let's set the workforce to 50. Um, also going up a little more. Now you'll notice that it's not still going up any further. And that's because right now we're bottlenecking at the network layer. Where the, the servers can't communicate fast enough. This is about as fast as people can go and talk to this Redis server. Um, those, those are reads. I'm going to switch over to uh, set. The same thing. We're ranked at around the 16,000 mark, plus per second. Um, and like, the, I mean, just right now, this is pretty impressive. You know, most databases, how many queries per second? I mean, in production for Desert News, you know, we have a cluster of master and slaves that handle about maybe four or five requests per second. Um, 
you know, and, and this is doing 30, 20 percent. But I mentioned the pipeline. So what we're doing is we're using the pipe set. So instead of sending it one at a time where it gets sent and gets a response back, I'm going to send lots of operations to set and then get them back. And we'll see what happens. So we have a pipe set. Okay. All right. So now we're at about 85 to 93,000 write operations per second. Um, and I can go ahead and bump that workforce up to 10. And what I'll do actually so you can see. Okay. And so here's, here's another tool that shows you kind of the commands um, per second. We're, we're hovering at about 95, 94. Uh, CPU, it's about 50% on the user side, so Redis is about 50%. And then actually the server is using pretty much the other 40%, 50% just to handle the network as well. So we'll get those commands coming across. Um, and, oh come on, I broke 100,000 this morning, earlier today. Oh come on! <laughs> so close, oh! Dang it. Well, Okay, so this is running on commodity virtual servers. This, this, is, this is not like the GPU super intensive power thing. This is running on a, just one step above the micro tier. On, uh, on so the, I was right. M1. M1. It's an M1. Uh, and actually, I tried it with uh, the CC2, the kind of CPU intensive ones, and I didn't do that much more. Literally, the volume. The volume. Now, if I wanted to be able to throughput even more, lots of reads and stuff, I could just spin up um, some servers, some slaves um, that will listen, and they'll be able to handle more operations. And so, uh, yeah. So let's go. Uh, so how many servers is this? So this is one. So it's one server one with a server, server. Fifteen servers with ten clients each, pounding the Reddit server. And, and like I said, if you've ever read on Amazon, you know those servers aren't that powerful. Um, and it's handling pretty well. Because this control panel is based off of that Redis server. So it's not like it's slow, it's not like it's breaking to his knees and my stuff's still working. Um, now if I switch back to idle mode, it'll drop off. And else? That 15 to 500. Those are just all the workers just doing a handful of commands that I use to kind of orchestrate them out. So all this code on GitHub is that this is my uh, user name just in front of me. GitHub. These are just in front of me. And you check it out. I have to add a bunch of more files and files. I don't remember. Um, but this is kind of zumbled to me. Any other questions? 
Yeah. What how do you use this for caching or what specifically? So I use it for caching, I use it for chat books. Um, and then at my last job, we have these uh, data scores that we store um, for uh, like compatibility between people. Um, but when we are scoring s scores between many people, between many people, that data moved very, very, very fast. Um, and the thing is, we, that, we didn't care if we lost that data because we could always regenerate the score. Um, so our MySQL tables, we have looked it up. We switched over when we had 978 million records. We just went under a billion when we switched to our new Redis system. Basically, because we spun up uh, three Redis servers that had three instances of Redis running, so nine running. <coughs> and then we just shard those. Each user had a hash, a hash that recorded them, and it would store 5,000 records in there. Um, and and that, that was stored up data for <coughs> Users. And then if a user didn't come to the site within a month, they fell off, and then when they re-logged in, they queued them up and say, hey, we want to process your scores again, and it took like five seconds. We went to reprocess them and saved them. And we went through all that hassle because we wanted to be people to be able to sort their score. And so we have a thing where we said, hey, you get an entire data set, and I want to be able to sort off that subset of users by whatever age or by close proximity to me, by whatever. Um, and then, and my current, and where I currently work, we have, um, uh, we just switched over to, we have a Redis server that uses PubSub. And so all of our web servers connect to that server and listen for cache expiration messages. And so when we change something in our CMS, um, it will send a message out through that saying, hey, this document ID has at least has expired. And then all of the servers will go and delete that cache entry. So and that's, and that used to be based off of UDP packets and some weird packets. And we just recently switched that over to Redis. Um, so for PubSub. It's so like if you're doing something with Socket.io, Redis is awesome to use that way. Um, so, any other questions? All this data, and then in code, I'll, I'll uh, um, make some changes. Now, if I want to like, go through the entire data set, maybe something like Lua would be nice. Because um, basically, if you have a huge set of operations that you want to run, it's easier to say, to pass it to Redis, say, hey, use a little bit of logic to run through all this, than to have the network bandwidth going back and forth saying, you know, set this, delete this, do this, do this. Yeah. Yeah. So, adjustment. Yeah. Um, with Redis, does it have uh, the, the notion of when you have a key, let's say that you want to expire all keys that start uh, user colon one thousand, right? Can you, uh, you know, delete all keys? Does it have any wild card? Or um, uh, I, so, if you wanted to say, I want to set an expiration time for all keys matching the pattern. I don't think it has that. The one thing no, that uh, more more like uh, a user is uh, you know deleted them you know one to remove themselves from your system or you know whatever else is happening you need to, to flush the cache in Redis for that user. So normally it's set without an expiry and it would just be there whenever you needed it. Uh, but for some reason you need to go in and yeah. manually purge that data. So so if you want to match up the pattern, um, this is like this is the one operation. They say do not use in production. So they use, they use it with, with caution. But you can you can basically pass patterns to to this to get a set of keys that match the pattern. And then you can iterate through that that result saying issue a delete for all of these um, all of these uh, keys. Um, uh, but the 
time complexity is this no end. So, so basically, the larger database, the longer the command is long. So if you have like millions of values in there, um, I mean, when I, when I say long, it might take half a second. Um, but if, if you build a large application with lots of stuff using keys, you'll lose your performance gain. Um, so, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it's crazy that it's an operation that takes under a second is like really long for them. Um, but, you know, Any other questions? As an example, when you're talking about the time, mm -hmm. the entry level laptop example? Yeah. Scans a million keys in 40 milliseconds. So yeah. I mean, it, it does have to traverse the whole tree, but that's all in the memory. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's all in memory. So it's just, you know, so if you had a billion, so how, how, many, how many did you say? A million keys, well, a million keys is 40 milliseconds, so a billion would be 4 seconds. 40 seconds. 40,000 milliseconds. So 40 seconds. I'm good at math. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, to get a billion keys, then maybe not. But yeah, so that's, but that's so you said you have to be aware. And you can make a program of production server that's already running 10,000. Yeah. Yeah. And there, depending on what you, what your needs are, there are other techniques yeah. to group things in that way. So what you can do is you can also yeah. Um, I mean, you could have a set that was just for that user, and everything was in that set. Yeah. And just flush that key. Yep. So there's there's a bunch of different things. So I so this still give you a little bit of chicken drive to ride around it. So my favorite thing to do to tell people is like just pick something small to try. Um, data that goes really well into Redis is data that you that you is real time that you want immediacy with. There's lots of it or like lots of reads and writes. And it's self-contained. So while it's it might be really large in volume, you know, it's like online users, it's really simple. Now, if I want to have a whole member system in here with lots of relational data, or then I wouldn't recommend using Redis because um, you have a lot of querying capabilities and stuff like this. But simple data that's real time is like Redis is very fun. Uh, there's uh, one, one of the log things is there's, there's a tool called Logstash that you can use to have it uh, follow all your logs and then parse them, clean them up, and save them up in JSON, and then allow other service to process that data. And typically what we recommend is using Redis servers in between. So it's just there it writes out so it's log stash so they write people who follow the logs, push all of the stuff to Redis into the queue, and then they have workers that read from Redis and process that data into some into more meaningful data. Um, but there's lots of cool stuff that uses Redis. Um, I bet your salt stacks yeah there's an highlight I was not much, but I've been using it for a year. Yeah, a lot of times. You know, like 100,000 servers that I was training data about commands that they run. The last couple of years. So, I'm um, trying to get uh, real world like uh, security precautions. Uh, okay, so security is it doesn't have a password. It doesn't have a password. We don't recommend you using it. Because Redis is so fast, the actual test, you can actually um, rainbow, rainbow attack. This is this is iterate to make a brute force attack on Redis server for like a six, seven on the password for the crack attacks. So realistically, you don't want you, you want this to be sitting behind a firewall or at IP table rules and say, hey, only allow these sort of stats and stuff. You have to like Redis. It doesn't have any security built in. Um, if you only want people to have access to certain stuff in the data, you have to have a separate credit server. It's kind of like once you have access, once you can communicate with it over a socket, it's pretty much yours. So is it under the water as well? Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>